Hear me. We've heard of Danish heroes, ancient kings and the glory they cut for themselves, swinging mighty swords. How Schild made slaves of soldiers from every land, crowds of captives he'd beaten into terror. He'd traveled to Denmark alone, an abandoned child, but changed his own fate. Lived to be rich and much honored. He ruled lands on all sides. Wherever the sea would take them, his soldiers sailed, returned with tribute and obedience. There was a brave king, and he gave them more than his glory, conceived a son for the Danes, a new leader, allowed them by the grace of God. They had lived before his coming, kingless and miserable. Now the Lord of all life, ruler of glory, blessed them with a prince, Beo, whose power and fame soon spread through the world. Schild's strong son was the glory of Denmark. His father's warriors were wound round his heart with golden rings, bound to their prince by his father's treasure. So young men build the future, wisely, open-handed in peace, protected in war. So warriors earn their fame, and wealth is shaped with a sword. When his time was come, the old king died, still strong, but called to the Lord's hands. His comrades carried him down to the shore, bore him as their leader had asked, their lord and companion, while words could move on his tongue. Schild's reign had been long. He'd ruled them well. There in the harbor was a ring-proud fighting ship, its timbers icy, waiting, and there they brought the beloved body of their ring-giving lord and laid him near the mast. Next to that noble corpse they heaped up treasures, jeweled helmets, hooked swords and coats of mail, armor, carried from the ends of the earth. No ship had ever sailed so brightly fitted, no king sent forth more deeply mourned, Forced to set him adrift, floating as far as the tide might run, they refused to give him less from their hordes of gold than those who'd shipped him away, an orphan and a beggar, to cross the waves alone. High up over his head they flew his shining banner, then sadly let the water pull at the ship, watched it slowly sliding to where neither rulers nor heroes nor anyone can say whose hands opened to take that motionless cargo. Then Beo was king in that Danish castle, Schild's son ruling as long as his father, and as loved, a famous lord of men, and he in turn gave his people a son, the great Heathdane, a fierce fighter who led the Danes to the end of his long life, and left them four children, three princes to guide them in battle, Hergar, and Hrothgar, and Halga the Good, and one daughter, Irs, who was given to Onela, king of the Swedes, and became his wife and their queen. Then Hrothgar, taking the throne, led the Danes to such glory that comrades and kinsmen swore by his sword, and young men swelled his armies, and he thought of greatness, and resolved to build a hall that would hold his mighty band and reach higher toward heaven than anything that had ever been known to the sons of men. And in that hall he'd divide the spoils of their victories, to old and young, what they'd earned in battle, but leaving the common pastures untouched and taking no lives. The work was ordered, the timbers tied, and shaped by the hosts that Hrothgar ruled. It was quickly ready, that most beautiful of dwellings, built as he'd wanted, and then he whose word was obeyed all over the earth named it Herat. His boast come true, he commanded a banquet, opened out his treasure-full hands, that towering place, gabled and huge, stood waiting for time to pass, for war to begin, for flames to leap as high as the feud that would light them, and for Herod to burn. A powerful monster 
living down in the darkness, growled in pain, impatient as day after day the music rang loud in that hall, the harp's rejoicing call and the poet's clear song sung of the ancient beginnings of us all, recalling the Almighty, making the earth, shaping these beautiful plains marked off by oceans, then proudly setting the sun and moon to glow across the land and light it. The corners of the earth were made lovely with trees and leaves, made quick with life, with each of the nations who now move on its face. And then, as now, warriors sang of their pleasure. So Hrothgar's men lived happy in his hall till the monster stirred, that demon, that fiend, Grendel, who haunted the moors, the wild marshes, and made his home in a hell not hell, but earth. He was spawned in that slime, conceived by a pair of those monsters born of Cain, murderous creatures, banished by God, punished forever for the crime of Abel's death. The Almighty drove those demons out, and their exile was bitter, shut away from men. They split into a thousand forms of evil, spirits and fiends, goblins, monsters, giants, a brood forever opposing the Lord's will, and again and again defeated. Then, when darkness had dropped, Grendel went up to Herod, wondering what the warriors would do in that hall when their drinking was done. He found them sprawled in sleep, suspecting nothing their dreams undisturbed. The monster's thoughts were as quick as his greed or his claws. He slipped through the door and there in the silence snatched up thirty men, smashed them unknowing in their beds and ran out with their bodies, the blood dripping behind him back to his lair, delighted with his night's slaughter. At daybreak, with the sun's first light, they saw how well he had worked, and in that gray morning broke their long feast with tears and laments for the dead. Hrothgar, their lord, sat joyless in Herod, a mighty prince, mourning the fate of his lost friends and companions, knowing by its tracks that some demon had torn his followers apart. He wept, fearing the beginning might not be the end. And that night Grendel came again, so set on murder that no crime could ever be enough, no savage assault quench his lust for evil. Then each warrior tried to escape him, search for rest in different beds as far from Herod as they could find, seeing how Grendel hunted when they slept. Distance was safety. The only survivors were those who fled him. Hate had triumphed. So Grendel ruled, fought with the righteous, won against many, and won. So Herod stood empty and stayed deserted for years, twelve winters of grief for Hrothgar, king of the Danes, sorrow heaped at his door by hell-forged hands. His misery leapt the seas, was told and sung in all men's ears, how Grendel's hatred began, how the monster relished his savage war on the Danes, keeping the bloody feud alive, seeking no peace, offering no truce, accepting no settlement, no price in gold or land, and paying the living for one crime only with another. No one waited for reparation from his plundering claws. That shadow of death hunted in the darkness, stalked Hrothgar's warriors, old and young, lying and waiting, hidden in mist, invisibly following them from the edge of the marsh, always there, unseen. So mankind's enemy continued his crimes, killing as often as he could, coming alone, bloodthirsty and horrible. Though he lived in Herod when the night hid him, he never dared to touch King Hrothgar's glorious throne, protected by God, God whose love Grendel could not know. But Hrothgar's heart was bent. The best and most noble of his council debated remedies, sat in secret sessions, talking of terror and wondering what the bravest of warriors could do. And sometimes they sacrificed to the old stone gods, made heathen vows, hoping for hell's support, the devil's guidance in driving their affliction off. 
That was their way, and the heathens' only hope, hell always in their hearts, knowing neither God nor his passing as he walks through our world, the Lord of heaven and earth. Their ears could not hear his praise nor know his glory. Let them beware those who are thrust into danger, clutched at by trouble, yet can carry no solace in their hearts, cannot hope to be better. Hail to those who will rise to God, drop off their dead bodies, and seek our Father's peace. So the living sorrow of Helftain's son simmered bitter and fresh, and no wisdom or strength could break it. That agony hung on king and people alike, harsh and unending, violent and cruel and evil. In his far-off home, Beowulf, Higlak's follower and the strongest of the Geats, greater and stronger than anyone anywhere in this world, heard how Grendel filled knights with horror and quickly commanded a boat fitted out, proclaiming that he'd go to that famous king, would sail across the sea to Hrothgar now when help was needed. None of the wise ones regretted his going, much as he was loved by the Geats. The omens were good, and they urged the adventure on. So Beowulf chose the mightiest men he could find, the bravest and best of the Geats, fourteen in all, and led them down to their boat. He knew the sea, would point the prow straight to that distant Danish shore. Then they sailed, set their ship out on the waves under the cliffs. Ready for what came, they wound through the currents, the seas beating at the sand, and were borne in the lap of their shining ship, lined with gleaming armor, going safely in that oak-hard boat to where their hearts took them. The wind hurried them over the waves, the ship foamed through the sea like a bird, until, in the time they had known it would take, standing in the round curled prow, they could see sparkling hills high and green jutting up over the shore, and rejoicing in those rock-steep cliffs, they quietly ended their voyage. Jumping to the ground, the Geats pushed their boat to the sand and tied it in place, mail shirts and armor rattling as they swiftly moored their ship, and then they gave thanks to God for their easy crossing. High on a wall, a Danish watcher patrolling along the cliffs saw the travelers crossing to the shore, their shields raised and shining. He came riding down Hrothgar's lieutenant, spurring his horse, needing to know why they'd landed these men in armor. Shaking his heavy spear in their faces, he spoke. Whose soldiers are you, you who've been carried in your deep-keeled ship across the sea road to this country of mine? Listen, I've stood on these cliffs longer than you know, keeping our coast free of pirates, raiders sneaking ashore from their ships, seeking our lives and our gold. None have ever come more openly. And yet you've offered no password, no sign from my prince, no permission from my people for your landing here. Nor have I ever seen out of all the men on earth one greater than has come with you. No commoner carries such weapons, unless his appearance and his beauty are both lies. You, tell me your name and your father's. No spies go further onto Danish soil than you've come already. Strangers, from wherever it was you sailed, tell it, and tell it quickly, the quicker the better, I say, for us all. Speak, say exactly who you are, and from where, and why. Their leader answered him, Beowulf, unlocking words from deep in his breast. We are Geats, men who follow Higlak. My father was a famous soldier, known far and wide as a leader of men. His name was Edgtho. His life lasted many winters. Wise men all over the earth surely remember him still. And we have come seeking your prince, Helftain's son, protector of this people only in friendship. Instruct us, watchman. Help us with your words. Our errand is a great one. Our business with the glorious king of the Danes no secret. There's nothing dark or hidden in our coming. You know, if we've heard the truth and been told honestly, that your country is cursed with some strange, vicious creature that hunts only at night and that no one has seen. It's said, watchman, that he has slaughtered your people, brought terror to the darkness. Perhaps Hrothgar can hunt here in my heart for some way to drive this devil out, if anything will ever end the evils afflicting your wise and famous lord. 
Here he can cool his burning sorrow. Or else he may see his suffering go on forever, for as long as Herod towers high on your hills. The mounted officer answered him bluntly, the brave watchman. A soldier should know the difference between words and deeds and keep that knowledge clear in his brain. I believe your words. I trust in your friendship. Go forward, weapons and armor and all, on into Denmark. I'll guide you myself, and my men will guard your ship. Keep it safe here on our shores, your fresh tarred boat. Watch it well until that curving prow carries across the sea to Geatland, a chosen warrior who bravely does battle with the creature haunting our people, who survives that horror unhurt and goes home bearing our love. Then they moved on. Their boat lay moored, tied tight to its anchor. Glittering at the top of their golden helmets, wild boar heads gleamed, shining decorations swinging as they marched, erect like guards, like sentinels, as though ready to fight. They marched, Beowulf and his men and their guide, until they could see the gables of Herod, covered with hammered gold and glowing in the sun, that most famous of all dwellings, towering majestic, its glittering roofs visible far across the land. Their guide reined in his horse, pointing to that hall built by Hrothgar for the best and bravest of his men. The path was plain. They could see their way. And then he spoke. Now I must leave you. May the Lord our God protect your coming and going. The sea is my job, keeping these coasts free of invaders, bands of pirates. I must go back. The path he'd shown them was paved, cobbled like a Roman road. They arrived with their mail shirts glittering, silver shining links clanking in iron song as they came. Sea weary still, they set their broad, battle hardened shields in rows along the wall, then stretched themselves on Herod's benches. Their armor rang, their ashwood spears stood in a line, gray tipped and straight. The Geats' war gear were honored weapons. A Danish warrior asked who they were, their names, and their fathers. Where have you carried these gold-carved shields from, these silvery shirts and helmets, and those spears set out in long lines? I am Hrothgar's herald and captain. Strangers have come here before, but never so freely, so bold. And you come too proudly to be exiles. Not poverty, but your heart's high courage has brought you to Hrothgar. He was answered by a famous soldier, the Geat's proud prince. We follow Higlock break bread at his side. I am Beowulf. My errand is for Heathdane's great son to hear, your glorious lord. If he chooses to receive us, we will greet him, salute the chief of the Danes, and speak out our message. Wolfgar replied, a prince born to the Swedes, famous for both strength and wisdom. Our warm-hearted lord will be told of your coming. I shall tell our king, our giver of bright rings, and hurry back with his word, and speak it here, however he answers your request. He went quickly to where Hrothgar sat, gray and old, in the middle of his men, and knowing the custom of that court, walked straight to the king's great chair, stood waiting to be heard, then spoke. There are geats who have come sailing the open ocean to our land come far over the high waves, led by a warrior called Beowulf. They wait on your word, bring messages for your ears alone. My lord, grant them a gracious answer. See them and hear what they've come for. Their weapons and armor are nobly worked. These men are no beggars. And Beowulf, their prince, who showed them the way to our shores, is a mighty warrior, powerful and wise. The Dane's high prince and protector answered, I knew Beowulf as a boy. His father was Edgtho, who was given Hrethel's one daughter, Hrethel, Higlak's father. Now Edgtho's brave son is here, come visiting a friendly king. And I've heard that when seamen came, bringing their gifts and presents to the Geats, they wrestled and ran together, and Higlak's young prince showed them a mighty battle grip, hands that move with thirty men's strength and courage to match. 
Our Holy Father has sent him as a sign of his grace, a mark of his favor to help us defeat Grendel and end that terror. I shall greet him with treasures, gifts to reward his courage in coming to us. Quickly, order them all to come to me together, Beowulf and his band of Geats, and tell them, too, how welcome we will make them. Then Wolfgar went to the door and addressed the waiting seafarers with soldiers' words. My lord, the great king of the Danes commands me to tell you that he knows of your noble birth, and that having come to him from over the open sea, you have come bravely and are welcome. Now, go to him as you are, in your armor and helmets, but leave your battle shields here and your spears. Let them lie waiting for the promises your words may make. Beowulf arose with his men around him, ordering a few to remain with their weapons, leading the others quickly along under Herod's steep roof into Hrothgar's presence. Standing on that prince's own hearth, helmeted, the silvery metal of his mail shirt gleaming with a smith's high art, he greeted the Dane's great lord. Hail, Hrothgar! Higlak is my cousin and my king. The days of my youth have been filled with glory. Now Grendel's name has echoed in our land. Sailors have brought us stories of Herod, the best of all mead halls, deserted and useless when the moon hangs in skies the sun had lit, light and life fleeing together. My people have said, the wisest, most knowing and best of them, that my duty was to go to the Dane's great king. They have seen my strength for themselves, have watched me rise from the darkness of war, dripping with my enemy's blood. I drove five great giants into chains, chased all of that race from the earth. I swam in the blackness of night, hunting monsters out of the ocean and killing them one by one. Death was my errand and the fate they had earned. Now Grendel and I are called together, and I've come. Grant me then, Lord and protector of this noble place, a single request. I have come so far, O shelter of warriors and your people's loved friend, that this one favor you should not refuse me, that I, alone and with the help of my men, may purge all evil from this hall. I have heard, too, that the monster's scorn of men is so great that he needs no weapons and fears none. Nor will I. My Lord Higlak might think less of me if I let my sword go where my feet were afraid to, if I hid behind some broad linden shield. My hands alone shall fight for me, struggle for life against the monster. God must decide who will be given to death's cold grip. Grendel's plan, I think, will be what it has been before, to invade this hall and gorge his belly with our bodies. If he can, if he can. And I think if my time will have come, there'll be nothing to mourn over, no corpse to prepare for its grave. Grendel will carry our bloody flesh to the moors, crunch on our bones, and smear torn scraps of our skin on the walls of his den. No, I expect no Danes will fret about sewing our shrouds if he wins. And if death does take me, Send the hammered mail of my armor to Higlek. Return the inheritance I had from Hrethel and he from Wayland. Fate will unwind as it must. Hrothgar replied, protector of the Danes. Beowulf, you've come to us in friendship, and because of the reception your father found at our court. Edgtho had begun a bitter feud, killing Hathlaf, a wolfing warrior. Your father's countrymen were afraid of war if he returned to his home, and they turned him away. Then he traveled across the curving waves to the land of the Danes. I was new to the throne then, a young man ruling this wide kingdom and its golden city. Herger, my older brother, a far better man than I, had died, and dying made me, second among Heathdane's sons, first in this nation. I bought the end of Edgtho's quarrel, sent ancient treasures through the ocean's furrows to the wolfings. Your father swore he'd keep that peace. My tongue grows heavy, and my heart, when I try to tell you what Grendel has brought us, the damage he's done here in this hall. 
You see for yourself how much smaller our ranks have become, and can guess what we've lost to his terror. Surely the Lord Almighty could stop this madness, smother his lust. How many times have my men, glowing with courage drawn from too many cups of ale, sworn to stay after dark and stem that horror with a sweep of their swords? And then, in the morning, this mead hall, glittering with new light, would be drenched with blood, the benches stained red, the floors all wet from that fiend's savage assault, and my soldiers would be fewer still, death taking more and more. But to table, Beowulf, a banquet in your honor. Let us toast your victories and talk of the future. Then Hrothgar's men gave places to the Geats, yielded benches to the brave visitors, and led them to the feast. The keeper of the mead came carrying out the curved flasks and poured that bright sweetness. A poet sang from time to time in a clear, pure voice. Danes and visiting Geats celebrated as one drank and rejoiced. Unferd spoke, Eglaf's son, who sat at Hrothgar's feet, spoke harshly and sharp, vexed by Beowulf's adventure, by their visitor's courage, and angry that anyone in Denmark or anywhere on earth had ever acquired glory and fame greater than his own. Your Beowulf! Are you the same boastful fool who fought a swimming match with Brekka? Both of you daring and young and proud, exploring the deepest seas, risking your lives for no reason but the danger? All older and wiser heads warned you not to, but no one could check such pride. With Brekka at your side, you swam along the sea paths, your swift-moving hands pulling you over the ocean's face. Then winter churned through the water. The waves ran you as they willed, and you struggled seven long nights to survive. And at the end, victory was his, not yours. The sea carried him close to his home, to southern Norway, near the land of the Brondings, where he ruled and was loved, where his treasure was piled, and his strength protected his towns and his people. He'd promised to outswim you. Bronston's son made that boast ring true. You've been lucky in your battles, Beowulf, but I think your luck may change if you challenge Grendel, staying a whole night through in this hall, waiting where that fiercest of demons can find you. Beowulf answered, Edge those great sun. Ah, Unferth, my friend, your face is hot with ale, and your tongue has tried to tell us about Brekka's doings. But the truth is simple. No man swims in the sea as I can. No strength is a match for mine. As boys, Brekka and I had boasted, we were both too young to know better, that we'd risk our lives far out at sea, and so we did. Each of us carried a naked sword, prepared for whales or the swift, sharp teeth and beaks of needlefish. He could never leave me behind, swim faster across the waves than I could, and I had chosen to remain close by his side. I remained near him for five long nights until a flood swept us apart. The frozen sea surged around me. It grew dark. The wind turned bitter, blowing from the north, and the waves were savage. Creatures who sleep deep in the sea were stirred into life, and the iron hammered links of my male shirt, these shiny bits of metal woven across my breast, saved me from death. A monster seized me, drew me swiftly toward the bottom, swimming with its claws tight in my flesh. But fate let me find its heart with my sword, hack myself free. I fought the beast's last battle, left it floating lifeless in the sea. Other monsters crowded around me, continually attacking. I treated them politely, offering the edge of my razor-sharp sword. But the feast, I think, did not please them filled their evil bellies with no banquet-rich food, thrashing there at the bottom of the sea. By morning they decided to sleep on the shore, lying on their backs, their blood spilled out on the sand. Afterwards, sailors could cross that sea road and feel no fear. Nothing would stop their passing. Then God's bright beacon appeared in the east. The water lay still, and at last I could see the land, wind-swept cliff walls, 
at the edge of the coast. Fate saves the living when they drive away death by themselves. Lucky or not, nine was the number of sea-huge monsters I killed. What man anywhere under heaven's high arch has fought in such darkness, endured more misery, or been harder pressed? Yet I survived the sea, smashed the monster's hot jaws, swam home from my journey, the swift flowing waters swept me along, and I landed on Finnish soil. I've heard no tales of you, Unferth, telling of such clashing terror, such contests in the night. Brekka's battles were never so bold, neither he nor you can match me, and I mean no boast, have announced no more than I know to be true. And there's more. You murdered your brothers, your own close kin. Words and bright wit won't help your soul. You'll suffer hell's fires, Unferth, forever tormented. Eglaf's proud son, if your hands were as hard as your heart, as fierce as you think it, no fool would dare to raid your hall, ruin Herat, and oppress its prince, as Grendel has done. But he's learned that terror is his alone, discovered he can come for your people with no fear of reprisal. He's found no fighting here, but only food, only delight. He murders as he likes with no mercy, gorges and feasts on your flesh, and expects no trouble, no quarrel from the quiet Danes. Now the Geats will show him courage. Soon he can test his strength in battle. And when the sun comes up again, opening another bright day from the south, anyone in Denmark may enter this hall. That evil will be gone. Hrothgar, gray-haired and brave, sat happily listening. The famous ring-giver sure, at last, that Grendel could be killed. He believed in Beowulf's bold strength and the firmness of his spirit. There was a sound of laughter and the cheerful clanking of cups and pleasant words. Then Welthau, Hrothgar's gold ring queen, greeted the warriors. A noble woman who knew what was right, she raised a flowing cup to Hrothgar first, holding it high for the lord of the Danes to drink, wishing him joy in that feast. The famous king drank with pleasure and blessed their banquet. Then Welthau went from warrior to warrior, pouring a portion of the jeweled cup for each, till the bracelet-wearing queen had carried the mead cup among them, and it was Beowulf's turn to be served. She saluted the Geat's great prince, thanked God for answering her prayers, for allowing her hands the happy duty of offering mead to a hero who would help her afflicted people. He drank what she poured, edged those brave son, then assured the Dane's queen that his heart was firm and his hands ready. When we crossed the sea, my comrades and I, I already knew that all my purpose was this, to win the good will of your people or die in battle, pressed in Grendel's fierce grip. Let me live in greatness and courage, or here in this hall, welcome my death. Welthau was pleased with his words, his bright tongue boasts. She carried them back to her lord, walked nobly across to his side. The feast went on, laughter and music and the brave words of warriors celebrating their delight. Then Hrothgar rose, Hiefdane's son, heavy with sleep. As soon as the sun had gone, he knew that Grendel would come to Herod would visit that hall when night had covered the earth with its net and the shapes of darkness moved black and silent through the world. Hrothgar's warriors rose with him. He went to Beowulf, embraced the Geat's brave prince, wished him well, and hoped that Herod would be his to command. And then he declared, No one strange to this land has ever been granted what I have given you. No one in all the years of my rule Make this best of all mead halls yours, and then keep it free of evil. Fight with glory in your heart. Purge Herod, and your ship will sail home with its treasure holds full. Then Hrothgar left that hall, the Dane's great protector, followed by his court. The queen had preceded him, and he went to lie at her side, seek sleep near his wife. 
It was said that God himself had set a sentinel in Herod, brought Beowulf as a guard against Grendel, and a shield behind whom the king could safely rest. And Beowulf was ready, firm with our Lord's high favor and his own bold courage and strength. He stripped off his mail shirt, his helmet, his sword hammered from the hardest iron, and handed all his weapons and armor to a servant, ordered his war gear guarded till morning. And then, standing beside his bed, he exclaimed, Grendel is no braver, no stronger than I am. I could kill him with my sword. I shall not, easy as it would be. This fiend is a bold and famous fighter, but his claws and teeth, scratching at my shield, his clumsy fists beating at my sword blade, would be helpless. I will meet him with my hands empty, unless his heart fails him, seeing a soldier waiting weaponless, unafraid. Let God, in his wisdom, extend his hand where he wills, reward whom he chooses. Then the Geat's great chief dropped his head to his pillow, and around him, as ready as they could be, lay the soldiers who had crossed the sea at his side, each of them sure that he was lost to the home he loved, to the high-walled towns, and the friends he had left behind, where both he and they had been raised. Each thought of the Danes murdered by Grendel in a hall where Geats and not Danes now slept. But God's dread loom was woven with defeat for the monster, good fortune for the Geats. Help against Grendel was with them and through the might of a single man they would win. Who doubts that God in his wisdom and strength holds the earth forever in his hands? Out in the darkness the monster began to walk. The warriors slept in that gabled hall where they had hoped that he would keep them safe from evil, guard them from death till the end of their days was determined and the thread should be broken. But Beowulf lay wakeful watching, waiting, eager to meet his enemy, and angry at the thought of his coming. Out from the marsh, from the foot of misty hills and bogs, bearing God's hatred, Grendel came, hoping to kill anyone he could trap on this trip to High Herod. He moved quickly through the cloudy night up from his swampland, sliding silently toward that gold-shining hall. He had visited Hrothgar's home before, knew the way. But never before nor after that night found Herod defended so firmly, his reception so harsh. He journeyed, forever joyless, straight to the door, then snapped it open, tore its iron fasteners with a touch, and rushed angrily over the threshold. He strode quickly across the inlaid floor, snarling and fierce. His eyes gleamed in the darkness, burned with a gruesome light. Then he stopped, seeing the hall crowded with sleeping warriors, stuffed with rows of young soldiers resting together, and his heart laughed. He relished the sight, intended to tear the life from those bodies by morning. The monster's mind was hot with the thought of food and the feasting his belly would soon know. But fate that night intended Grendel to gnaw the broken bones of his last human supper. Human eyes were watching his evil steps, waiting to see his swift, hard claws. Grendel snatched at the first geat he came to, ripped him apart, cut his body to bits with powerful jaws, drank the blood from his veins, and bolted him down hands and feet. Death and Grendel's great teeth came together, snapping life shut. Then he stepped to another still body, clutched at Beowulf with his claws grasped at a strong-hearted, wakeful sleeper, and was instantly seized himself, claws bent back as Beowulf leaned up on one arm. That shepherd of evil, guardian of crime, knew at once that nowhere on earth had he met a man whose hands were harder. His mind was flooded with fear, but nothing could take his talons and himself from that tight, hard grip. Grendel's one thought 
was to run from Beowulf, flee back to his marsh, and hide there. This was a different Herod than the hall he had emptied. But Higlak's follower remembered his final boast, and standing erect, stopped the monster's flight, fastened those claws in his fists till they cracked, clutched Grendel closer. The infamous killer fought for his freedom, wanting no flesh but retreat, desiring nothing but escape. His claws had been caught. He was trapped. That trip to Herod was a miserable journey for the writhing monster. The high hall rang, its roof boards swayed, and the Danes shook with terror. Down the aisles the battle swept, angry and wild. Herod trembled, wonderfully built to withstand the blows, the struggling great bodies beating at its beautiful walls. Shaped and fastened with iron inside and out, artfully worked, the building stood firm. Its benches rattled, fell to the floor, gold-covered boards grating as Grendel and Beowulf battled to cross them. Hrothgar's wise men had fashioned Herod to stand forever. Only fire, they had planned, could shatter what such skill had put together, swallow in hot flames such splendor of ivory and iron and wood. Suddenly the sounds changed. The Danes started in new terror, cowering in their beds as the terrible screams of the Almighty's enemy sang in the darkness, the horrible shrieks of pain and defeat, the tears torn out of Grendel's taut throat, Hell's captive caught in the arms of him who of all the men on earth was the strongest. That mighty protector of men meant to hold the monster till its life leaped out, knowing the fiend was no use to anyone in Denmark. All of Beowulf's band had jumped from their beds, ancestral swords raised and ready, determined to protect their prince if they could. Their courage was great, but all wasted. They could hack at Grendel from every side, trying to open a path for his evil soul, but their points could not hurt him. The sharpest and hardest iron could not scratch at his skin, for that sin-stained demon had bewitched all men's weapons, laid spells that blunted every mortal man's blade. And yet his time had come, his days were over, his death near. Down to hell he would go, swept groaning and helpless to the waiting hands of still worse fiends. Now he discovered, once the afflictor of men, tormentor of their days, what it meant to feud with Almighty God. Grendel saw that his strength was deserting him, his claws bound fast, Higlak's brave follower tearing at his hands. The monstrous hatred rose higher, but his power had gone. He twisted in pain, and the bleeding sinews deep in his shoulders snapped, muscle and bones split and broke. The battle was over. Beowulf had been granted new glory. Grendel escaped, but wounded as he was, could flee to his den, his miserable hole at the bottom of the marsh, only to die, to wait for the end of all his days. And after that bloody combat, the Danes laughed with delight. He who had come to them from across the sea, bold and strong-minded, had driven affliction off, purged Herod clean. He was happy now with that night's fierce work. The Danes had been served as he'd boasted he'd served them. Beowulf, a prince of the Geats, had killed Grendel, ended the grief, the sorrow, the suffering forced on Hrothgar's helpless people by a bloodthirsty fiend. No Dane doubted the victory, for the proof, hanging high from the rafters where Beowulf had hung it, was the monster's arm, claw and shoulder and all. And then, in the morning, crowds surrounded Herod, warriors coming to that hall from faraway lands. Princes and leaders of men hurrying to behold the monster's great staggering tracks. They gaped with no sense of sorrow, felt no regret for his suffering, went tracing his bloody footprints, his beaten and lonely flight to the edge of the lake where he dragged his corpse-like way, doomed and already weary of his vanishing life. The water was bloody, steaming and boiling in horrible pounding waves, Heat sucked from his magic veins, but the swirling surf had covered his death. 
hidden deep in murky darkness, his miserable end as hell opened to receive him. Then old and young rejoiced, turned back from that happy pilgrimage, mounted their hard-hooved horses, high-spirited stallions, and rode them slowly toward Herod again, retelling Beowulf's bravery as they jogged along. And over and over they swore that nowhere on earth or under the spreading sky or between the seas neither south nor north was there a warrior worthier to rule over men but no one meant beowulf's praise to belittle hrothgar their kind and gracious king and sometimes when the path ran straight and clear they would let their horses race red and brown and pale yellow backs streaming down the road and sometimes a proud old soldier who had heard songs of the ancient heroes and could sing them all through, story after story, would weave a net of words for Beowulf's victory, tying the knot of his verses smoothly, swiftly into place with a poet's quick skill, singing his new song aloud while he shaped it, and the old songs as well, Siegmund's adventures, familiar battles fought by that glorious son of Vels, and struggles, too, against evil and treachery that no one had ever heard of, that no one knew except Fitla, who had fought at his uncle's side, a brave young comrade, carefully listening when Siegmund's tongue unwound the wonders he had worked, confiding in his closest friend. They were tales of giants wiped from the earth by Siegmund's might, and forever remembered fame that would last him beyond life and death, his daring battle with a treasure-rich dragon. Heaving a hoary gray rock aside, Siegmund had gone down to the dragon alone, entered the hole where it hid, and swung his sword so savagely that it slit the creature through, pierced its flesh, and pinned it to a wall, hung it where his bright blade rested. His courage and strength had earned him a king-like treasure, brought gold and rich rings to his glorious hands. He loaded that precious hoard on his ship and sailed off with a shining cargo. And the dragon dissolved in its own fierce blood. No prince, no protector of his warriors, knew power and fame and glory like Siegmund's. His name and his treasures grew great. Hermod could have hoped for at least as much. He was once the mightiest of men, but pride and defeat and betrayal sent him into exile with the Jutes, and he ended his life on their swords. That life had been misery after misery, and he spread sorrow as long as he lived it, heaped troubles on his unhappy people's heads, ignored all wise men's warnings, ruled only with courage. A king born and trusted with ancient treasures and cities full of strong-hearted soldiers, his vanity swelled him so vile and rank that he could hear no voice but his own. He deserved to suffer and die. But Beowulf was a prince well loved, followed in friendship, not fear. Hermod's heart had been hollowed by sin. The horses ran, when they could, on the gravel path. Morning slid past and was gone. The whole brave company came riding to Herod, anxious to celebrate Beowulf's success and stare at that arm. And Hrothgar rose from beside his wife and came with his courtiers, crowded around him. And Welthau rose and joined him, his wife and queen with her women, all of them walking to that wonderful hall. Hrothgar stood at the top of the stairway and stared at Grendel's great claw, swinging high from that gold-shining roof. Then he cried, Let God be thanked! Grendel's terrible anger hung over our heads too long, dropping down misery. But the Almighty makes miracles when he pleases, wonder after wonder, and this world rests in his hands. I had given up hope, exhausted prayer, expected nothing but misfortune forever. Herod was empty, bloody. The wisest and best of our people despaired as deeply, found hope no easier, knew nothing, no way to end this unequal war of men and devils, warriors and monstrous fiends. One man found it, 
came to Denmark and with the Lord's help did what none of the Danes could do. Our wisdom, our strength, worthless without him. The woman who bore him, whoever, wherever, alive now or dead, knew the grace of the God of our fathers was granted a son for her glory and his. Beowulf, best of soldiers, let me take you to my heart, make you my son too, and love you. Preserve this passionate peace between us, and take in return whatever you may want from whatever I own. Warriors deserving far less have been granted as much, given gifts and honored, though they fought no enemy like yours. Glory is now yours forever and ever. Your courage has earned it, and your strength. May God be as good to you forever as he has been to you here. Then Beowulf answered, What we did was what our hearts helped our hands to perform. We came to fight with Grendel, our strength against his. I wish I could show you here in Herod his corpse stretched on this floor. I twisted my fingers around his claw, ripped and tore at it as hard as I could. I meant to kill him right here, hold him so tightly that his heart would stop, would break, his life spill on this floor. But God's will was against me. As hard as I held him, he still pulled free and ran, escaped from this hall with the strength fear had given him. But he offered me his arm in his claw, saved his life, yet left me that prize. And paying even so willingly for his freedom, he still fled with nothing but the end of his evil days, ran with death pressing at his back, pain splitting his panicked heart, pulling him step by step into hell. Let him burn in torment, lying and trembling, waiting for the brightness of God to bring him his reward. Unferth grew quiet, gave up quarreling over Beowulf's old battles, stopped all his boasting once everyone saw proof of that prince's strength, Grendel's huge claw swinging high from Hrothgar's mead hall roof the fingers of that loathsome hand ending in nails as hard as bright steel. So hard, they all said, that not even the sharpest of swords could have cut it through, broken it off the monster's arm, and ended its life, as Beowulf had done armed with only his bare hands. Then the king ordered Herod cleaned and hung with decorations. Hundreds of hands, men and women, hurried to make the great hall ready. Golden tapestries were lined along the walls for a host of visitors to see and take pleasure in. But that glorious building was bent and broken, its iron hinges cracked and sprung from their corners all around the hall. Only its roof was undamaged when the blood-stained demon burst out of Herod, desperately breaking Beowulf's grip, running wildly from what no one escapes, struggle and writhe as he will. Wanting to stay, we go, all beings here on God's earth, wherever it is written that we go, taking our bodies from death's cold bed to the unbroken sleep that follows life's feast. Then Hrothgar made his way to the hall. It was time, and his heart drew him to the banquet. No victory was celebrated better by more or by better men and their king. A mighty host and famous they lined the benches, rejoicing. The king and Hrothulf, his nephew, toasted each other, raised mead cups high under Herod's great roof, their speech courteous and warm. King and people were one. None of the Danes was plotting. Then no treachery hid in their smiles. Hiefdane's son gave Beowulf a golden banner, a fitting flag to signal his victory, and gave him, as well, a helmet and a coat of mail and an ancient sword. They were brought to him while the warriors watched. Beowulf drank to those presents, not ashamed to be praised, richly rewarded in front of them all. No ring-giver has given four such gifts, passed such treasures through his hands, with the grace and warmth that Hrothgar showed. The helmet's brim was wound with bands of metal, 
rounded ridges to protect whoever wore it from the swords swung in the fiercest battles, shining iron edges in hostile hands. And then the protector of warriors, Lord of the Danes, ordered eight horses led to the hall, and into it eight steeds with golden bridles. One stood with a jeweled saddle on his back, carved like the king's war seat it was. It had carried Hrothgar when that great son of Hefdane rode to war, and each time carried him wherever the fighting was most fierce and his followers had fallen. Then Beowulf had been honored by both the gifts Hrothgar could have given him, horses and weapons. The king commanded him to use them well. Thus that guardian of Denmark's treasures had repaid a battle fought for his people, by giving noble gifts, had earned praise for himself from those who try to know truth. And more, the Lord of Herod ordered treasure gifts for each of the Geats who'd sailed with Beowulf and still sat beside him, ancient armor and swords, and for the one murdered by Grendel, gold was carefully paid. The monster would have murdered again and again had not God and the hero's courage turned fate aside. Then and now men must lie in their maker's holy hands, moved only as he wills. Our hearts must seek out that will. The world, in its long days full of labor, brings good and evil. All who remain here meet both. Hrothgar's hall resounded with the harp's high call, with songs and laughter and the telling of tales, stories sung by the court poet as the joyful Danes drank and listened, seated among their mead benches. He told them of Finn's people, attacking Hnaf with no warning, half wiping out that Danish tribe and killing its king. Finn's wife, Hnaf's sister, learned what good faith was worth to her husband. His honeyed words and treachery cost her two beloved lives, her son and her brother, both falling on spears guided by fate's hand. How she wept! And when morning came, she had reason to mourn, to weep for her dead, her slaughtered son, and the bloody corpse of his uncle, both the men she most dearly loved, and whose love she could trust to protect her. But Finn's troops, too, had fallen to Danish spears. Too few were left to drive the Danes to their death, to force Hanaf's follower, Hengist, to flee the hall where they'd fought and he'd stayed. Finn offered them, instead of more war, words of peace. There would be no victory. They'd divide the hall and the throne, half to the Danes, half to Finn's followers. When gifts were given, Finn would give Hengist and his soldiers half, share shining rings, silver and gold, with the Danes, both sides equal, all of them richer, all of their purses heavy, every man's heart warm with the comfort of gold. Both sides accepted peace and agreed to keep it. Finn swore it with solemn oaths. What wise men had written was his word as well as theirs. He and the brave Hengist would live like brothers. Neither leader nor led would break the truce, would not talk of evil things, remind the Danes that the man they served killed Hanaf, their lord. They had no king and no choice. And he swore that his sword would silence wagging tongues if Frisian warriors stirred up hatred, brought back the past. A funeral pyre was prepared and gold was brought. Hanaf's dead body was dressed for burning and the others with him. Bloody male shirts could be seen and golden helmets, some carved with boar heads, all battle hard and as useless now as the corpses that still wore them. Soldier after soldier. Then Hnaf's sister, Finn's sad wife, gave her son's body to be burned in that fire. The flames charring his uncle would consume both kinsmen at once. Then she wept again, and weeping sang the dead's last praise. The Danish king was lifted into place. Smoke went curling up. Logs roared, open wounds split and burst, skulls melted, blood came bubbling down, and the greedy fire demons drank flesh and bones from the dead of both sides, until nothing 
was left. Finn released a few of his soldiers, allowed them to return to their distant towns and estates. Hengist lived the whole stormy winter through, there with Finn, whom he hated. But his heart lived in Denmark, which he and the other survivors could not visit, could not sail to, as long as the wind-whipped sea crashed and whirled, or while winter's cold hands froze the water hard, tied it in icy knots. They would wait for the new year, for spring to come following the sun, melting the old year away and reopening the ocean. Winter was over, the earth grew lovely, and Hengis dreamed of his home. But revenge came first, settling his bitter feud with Finn, whose bloody sword he could never forget. He planned, he waited, wove plans and waited. Then a Danish warrior dropped a sword in his lap, a weapon Finn and his men remembered and feared, and the time had come, and Hengis rose, hearing the Danes murmur, and drove his new sword into Finn's belly, butchering that king under his own roof. And the Danes rose, their hearts full of Finn's treachery, and the misery he'd brought them, their sword arms restless and eager. The hall they'd shared with their enemies ran red with enemy blood, and bodies rolled on the floor beside Finn. They took the queen, looted everything they could find that belonged to her dead husband, loaded their ship with rings, necklaces, shining jewels wonderfully worked, and sailed, bringing treasure and a willing captive to the land she'd left and had longed for, alone no longer. The singer finished his song, his listeners laughed and drank, their pleasure loud in that hall. The cupbearers hurried with their sparkling vessels, and then the queen, Welthau, wearing her bright crown, appeared among them, came to Hrothgar and Hrothulf, his nephew, seated peacefully together, their friendship and Hrothulf's good faith still unbroken. And Unferth sat at Hrothgar's feet, and everyone trusted him believed in his courage, although he'd spilled his relative's blood. Then Welthau spoke, Accept this cup, my lord and king, may happiness come to the Danes' great ring-giver. May the Geats receive mild words from your mouth, words they have earned. Let gifts flow freely from your open hands, treasures your armies have brought you from all over the world. I have heard that the greatest of the Geats now rests in your heart like a son. Herod stands purged, restored by his strength. Celebrate his courage, rejoice and be generous, while a kingdom sits in your palm, a people and power that death will steal. But your sons will be safe, sheltered in Hrothulf's gracious protection, if fate takes their father while Hrothulf is alive. I know your nephew's kindness. I know he'll repay in kind the goodness you have shown him. Support your two young sons as you and I sustained him in his own early days. His father dead and he but a boy. Then she walked to the bench where Hrethric and Hrothmund, her two sons, sat together. Beowulf, prince of the Geats, was seated between them. Crossing the hall, she sat quietly at their side. They brought a foaming cup and offered it to Beowulf. It was taken and given in friendship, and he was given a mail shirt and golden armbands and the most beautiful necklace known to men. Nowhere in any treasure hoard anywhere on earth was there anything like it. Not since Hama carried the Brosing's necklace home to his glorious city, saved its tight-carved jewels and his skin and his soul from Ermic's treachery, and then came to God. Higlock had it next, Swerting's grandson, defending the golden hoard his battle-hard hands had won for him. The Geat's proud king lost it, was carried away by fate when too much pride made him feud with the Frisians. He had asked for misery, it was granted him. He'd borne those precious stones on a ship's broad back. He fell beneath his shield, his body, and his shining coat of mail, and that necklace, all lay for Franks to pluck, for jackal warriors to find when they walked through the row of corpses. Geats and their king lay slaughtered wherever the robbers looked. The warriors shouted, and Welthau spoke, 
Wear these bright jewels, beloved Beowulf. Enjoy them, and the rings, and the gold. O oh, fortunate young warrior, grow richer. Let your fame and your strength go hand in hand. And lend these two boys your wise and gentle heart. I'll remember your kindness. Your glory is too great to forget. It will last forever, wherever the earth is surrounded by the sea. The wind's home and waves lap at its walls. Be happy for as long as you live. Your good fortune warms my soul. Spread your blessed protection across my son and my king's son. All men speak softly here, speak mildly, and trust their neighbors. Protect their lord, our loyal followers, who would fight as joyfully as they drink. May your heart help you do as I ask. She returned to her seat. The soldiers ate and drank like kings. The savage fate decreed for them hung dark and unknown. What would follow after nightfall when Hrothgar withdrew from the hall, sought his bed, and left his soldiers to theirs? Herod would house a host of men that night, as it had been meant to do. They stacked away the benches, spread out blankets and pillows. But those beer-drinking sleepers lay down with death beside their beds. They slept with their shining shields at the edge of their pillows. The hall was filled with helmets hanging near motionless heads. Spears stood by their hands. Their hammered mail shirts covered their chests. It was the Danes' custom to be ready for war wherever they rested, at home or in foreign lands, at their lord's quick call if he needed them if trouble came to their king. They knew how soldiers must live. They sank into sleep. The price of that evening's rest was too high for the Dane who bought it with his life, paying as others had paid when Grendel inhabited Herod, the hall his till his crimes pulled him into hell. And now it was known that a monster had died, but a monster still lived and meant revenge. She'd brooded on her loss, Misery had brewed in her heart, that female horror, Grendel's mother, living in the murky cold lake, assigned her since Cain had killed his only brother, slain his father's son with an angry sword. God drove him off, outlawed him to the dry and barren desert, and branded him with a murderer's mark. And he bore a race of fiends, accursed like their father. So Grendel was drawn to Herod, an outcast, come to meet the man who awaited him. He'd snatched at Beowulf's arm, but that prince remembered God's grace and the strength he'd given him and relied on the Lord for all the help, the comfort and support he would need. He killed the monster, as God had meant him to do, tore the fiend apart, and forced him to run as rapidly as he could toward death's cold, waiting hands. His mother's sad heart and her greed drove her from her den on the dangerous pathway of revenge. So she reached Harat, where the Danes slept as though already dead. Her visit ended their good fortune, reversed the bright vein of their luck. No female, no matter how fierce, could have come with a man's strength, fought with the power and courage men fight with smashing their shining swords, their bloody hammer-forged blades, onto boar-headed helmets, slashing and stabbing with the sharpest of points. The soldiers raised their shields and drew those gleaming swords, swung them above the piled-up benches, leaving their mail shirts and their helmets where they'd lain when the terror took hold of them. To save her life, she moved still faster, took a single victim and fled from the hall, running to the moors, discovered, but her supper assured, sheltered in her dripping claws. She'd taken Hrothgar's closest friend, the man he most loved of all men on earth. She'd killed a glorious soldier, cut a noble life short. No geet could have stopped her. Beowulf and his band had been given better beds. Sleep had come to them in a different hall. Then all Herod burst into shouts. She had carried off Grendel's claw. Sorrow had returned to Denmark. They'd traded deaths, Danes and monsters, and no one had won. Both had lost. The wise old king trembled in anger and grief, his dearest friend and adviser dead. Beowulf was sent for at once. A messenger went swiftly to his rooms and brought him. 
He came, his band about him, as dawn was breaking through, the best of all warriors, walking to where Hrothgar sat waiting, the gray-haired king wondering if God would ever end this misery. The Geats tramped quickly through the hall, their steps beat and echoed in the silence. Beowulf rehearsed the words he would want with Hrothgar. He'd ask the Danes' great lord if all were at peace, if the night had passed quietly. Hrothgar answered him, protector of his people. There's no happiness to ask about. Anguish has descended on the Danes. Escher is dead, Ermlaf's older brother, and my own most trusted counselor and friend, my comrade when we went into battle, who'd beaten back enemy swords standing at my side. All my soldiers should be as he was, their hearts as brave and as wise. Another wandering fiend has found him in Herit, murdered him, fled with his corpse. He'll be eaten, his flesh become a horrible feast. And who knows where the beast may be hiding, its belly stuffed full. She's taking revenge for your victory over Grendel, for your strength, your mighty grip, and that monster's death. For years he'd been preying on my people. You came, he was dead in a single day, and now there's another one, a second hungry fiend determined to avenge the first, a monster willing and more than able to bring us more sorrow, or so it must seem to the many men mourning that noble treasure giver. For all men were treated nobly by those hands. Now for... I've heard that my people, peasants working in the fields, have seen a pair of such fiends wandering in the moors and the marshes, giant monsters living in those desert lands. And they've said to my wise men that as well as they could see, one of the devils was a female creature. The other, they say, walked through the wilderness like a man mightier than any man. They were frightened, and they fled, hoping to find help in Herod. They named the huge one Grendel. If he had a father, no one knew him, or whether there'd been others before these two, hidden evil before hidden evil. They live in secret places, windy cliffs, wolf dens, where water pours from the rocks, then runs underground, where mist steams like black clouds, and the groves of trees growing out over their lake are all covered with frozen spray, and wind down snake-like roots that reach as far as the water and help keep it dark. At night, that lake burns like a torch. No one knows its bottom. No wisdom reaches such depths. A deer hunted through the woods by packs of hounds, a stag with great horns, though driven through the forest from faraway places, prefers to die on those shores, refuses to save its life in that water. It isn't far, nor is it a pleasant spot. When the wind stirs and storms, waves splash toward the sky as dark as the air, as black as the rain that the heavens weep. Our only help, again, lies with you. Grendel's mother is hidden in her terrible home, in a place you've not seen. Seek it, if you dare. Save us once more, and again twisted gold, heaped up ancient treasure will reward you for the battle you win. Beowulf spoke. Let your sorrow end. It is better for us all to avenge our friends, not mourn them forever. Each of us will come to the end of this life on earth. He who can earn it should fight for the glory of his name. Fame after death is the noblest of goals. Arise, guardian of this kingdom. Let us go as quickly as we can and have a look at this lady monster. I promise you this. She'll find no shelter, no hole in the ground, no towering tree, no deep bottom of a lake where her sins can hide. Be patient for one more day of misery. I ask for no longer. The old king leaped to his feet, gave thanks to God for such words. Then Hrothgar's horse was brought, saddled and bridled. The Danes' wise ruler rode, stately and splendid. Shield-bearing soldiers marched at his side. The monster's tracks led them through the forest. They followed her heavy feet that had swept straight across the shadowy wasteland. 
her burden the lifeless body of the best of Hrothgar's men. The trail took them up towering rocky hills and over narrow winding paths they had never seen, down steep and slippery cliffs where creatures from deep in the earth hid in their holes. Hrothgar rode in front with a few of his most knowing men to find their way. Then suddenly, where clumps of trees bent across cold gray stones, they came to a dismal wood. Below them was the lake, its water bloody and bubbling, and the Danes shivered, miserable, mighty men, tormented by grief, seeing there on that cliff above the water Escher's bloody head. They looked down at the lake, felt how its heat rose up, watched the waves blood-stained swirling. Their battle horn sounded, then sounded again. Then they set down their weapons. They could see the water crawling with snakes, fantastic serpents swimming in the boiling lake, and sea beasts lying on the rocks, the kind that infests the ocean, in the early dawn, often ending some ship's journey with their wild jaws. They rushed angrily out of sight when the battle horns blew. Beowulf aimed an arrow at one of the beasts, swimming sluggishly away, and the point pierced its hide, stabbed to its heart. Its life leaked out. Death swept it off. Quickly, before the dying monster could escape, they hooked its thrashing body with their curved boar spears, fought it to land, drew it up on the bluff, then stood and stared at the incredible wave roamer, covered with strange scales and horrible. Then Beowulf began to fasten on his armor, not afraid for his life, but knowing the woven mail with its hammered links could save that life when he lowered himself into the lake, keep slimy monsters' claws from snatching at his heart, preserve him for the battle he was sent to fight. Hrothgar's helmet would defend him, that ancient shining treasure, encircled with hard-rolled metal, set there by some smith's long dead hand, would block all battle swords, stop all blades from cutting at him when he'd swum toward the bottom, gone down in the surging water, deep toward the swirling sands. And Unferth helped him, Hrothgar's courtier, lent him a famous weapon, a fine hilted old sword named Hrunting. It had an iron blade etched and shining and hardened in blood. No one who'd worn it into battle, swung it in dangerous places, daring and brave, had ever been deserted. Nor was Beowulf's journey the first time it was taken to an enemy's camp, or asked to support some hero's courage and win him glory. Unferth had tried to forget his greeting to Beowulf, his drunken speech of welcome. A mighty warrior, he lent his weapon to a better one. Only Beowulf would risk his life in that lake. Unferth was afraid gave up that chance to work wonders, win glory and a hero's fame. But Beowulf and fear were strangers. He stood ready to dive into battle.